hydrothermal vents, exploring hot springs on the deep seafloor, you're in the right place. Coming up, we'll hear from Hui Marine geologist Susan Humphreys, Hui Marine biologist Tim Shank, and Carleton College marine biologist Rika Anderson. Hi everyone, in just a few minutes we'll get started with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Encounters presentation about hydrothermal vents. We've still got a lot of people joining us, so thank you for your patience. Hello, you've joined Hydrothermal Vents, exploring hot springs on the deep seafloor, a Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Ocean Encounters presentation. We have a lot of people joining us tonight, so please bear with us. We'll get started very shortly.
The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration, and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome to Ocean Encounters, a series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as we like to call it for short. Tonight's event is Hydrothermal Vents, Exploring Hot Springs on the Deep Sea Floor. My name is Veronique LeCapra, and I'll be your host for tonight. HUI's Ocean Encounters events are made possible in part by the Avatar Alliance Foundation and Dalio Philanthropies. Thank you. And I'm happy to announce that our fifth season of Ocean Encounters is also an endorsed activity of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Before we hear from our panelists tonight, I'd like to take a minute and share some tips about how you can optimize your Zoom experience with us. Throughout the evening, our speakers will be taking questions from all of you. If you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type a a question in the window that will appear. You might be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but please ask your questions using the Q&A function instead. We often get hundreds of questions, so I apologize if we don't get to yours while we're live. You can ask questions at any time, starting now. I also want to let you know that we are recording this event. That recording will be made available on the hui.edu website. We had more than 2,965 people pre-registered to join us on Zoom tonight. That might not even be the, high, the top total, but uh, you are in very good company. We also have viewers joining us right now on Facebook and on YouTube. So to all of you, thank you and welcome. Tonight, we're going to talk about hydrothermal vents. Like geysers or hot springs on land, hydrothermal vents form in volcanic regions but at the bottom of the ocean. Along with being under extremely high pressure, the water at the bottom of the ocean is usually pretty cold, just above freezing. But the mineral-rich fluids gushing out of hydrothermal vents can reach temperatures of more than 750 degrees Fahrenheit. That's more than 400 degrees Celsius. Maybe even more amazing is that there are actually animals and other life forms that have adapted to live in these extreme environments under conditions a lot like those that probably existed when life first formed on Earth several billion years ago. And now I'd like to bring in our speakers. Here to tell us more about hydrothermal vents are Hui marine geologist Susan Humphreys, Hui marine biologist Tim Shank, and Carleton College marine biologist, Rika Anderson. Welcome, everybody. Before we get into things, let's have each of you briefly introduce yourselves. Susan and Tim, you're both at Hui, so let's have our Carleton guests go first. Rika, tell us a little bit about your research. Sure, uh, my name is Rika Anderson. I'm a marine microbiologist at Carleton College in Minnesota, and I study the microbes and the viruses that live in hydrothermal vents. All right, Tim, you're up. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm Tim Shank. I'm a deep sea biologist from the Woods Hole Oceanographic, and I've been working on um, the evolution and diversity of life in a deep ocean for, this is my 30th year, uh, so happy to be here. And I've been very fortunate to go around the world studying life, uh, diving in submarines. In fact, I've got more than 75 dives in Alvin, and I'm so grateful and so happy to share my experiences with you tonight. That's wonderful. So we've heard from our two biologists. Let's bring in some geology. Susan, go ahead. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Susan Humphreys. I'm a geochemist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And I can beat Tim and how long I've worked on these systems because I've been doing it for over 45 years. And I work on the nature and distribution of hydrothermal vents and what role they might play in regulating the composition of seawater. All right, so Susan, I wanna stay with you for a little bit and have you tell us more about the vents themselves Let's maybe just start with the basics. What is a hydrothermal vent and how is it different from say an underwater volcano? 
Okay, so a hydrothermal vent, as I think you mentioned in the introduction, is essentially a hot spring that is forming at the bottom of the ocean. Now, they look a bit different, and that's because of where they are. But the mechanism by which they form is the, is the same as for hot springs on land. The basic idea is that, in our case, seawater percolates into the oceanic crust, which is made dominantly of lava from volcanoes. Um, but that lava is very permeable, and so seawater seeps down into it. Now, if it does that near a volcano where there is um, a magma reservoir beneath it, then that hot water, that water gets heated up. And as we know, hot things rise. You can see it rising there through the crust and discharges on the sea floor to what we call a hydrothermal vent. And so that's basically how they're formed. Now, they are different from um, underwater volcanoes. Underwater volcanoes are essentially the same as on land. They're geologic features that are created by molten rock that is rising up to the surface or the seafloor and erupting and flowing out and creating a geologic structure that is essentially a volcano. And we have a lot of volcanoes in the ocean, particularly along the mid-ocean ridges, where we have um, a, the longest chain of volcanoes in the world with um, a, a, about 40,000 uh, 40, miles or so of volcanoes. So they're very different. This is lava coming out, but there is a link between hydrothermal um, vents and underwater volcanoes, because as we've mentioned, underwater volcano or hydrothermal vents require heat to drive that seawater circulation system through the crust. And so hydrothermal vents often occur near volcanoes, not always, but very often. So there's a direct link between the two. Okay, so we're looking at some hydrothermal vents there. Give us a sense of scale. How, how big are they and over how big of an area are they found? Yeah, so um, hydrothermal vents come in all sorts of different sizes. They grow very quickly. I think the tallest one I've ever seen was about 25 meters or about 80 feet, although there have been reports of some much taller than that. Very often hydrothermal chimneys or hydrothermal vents will occur over in a given area, which we call a hydrothermal field that might be include a number of vents in an area that may be tens of kilometers by tens of kilometers. Worldwide, um, we are still discovering these systems. To date, there's been over 500 of these discovered. And most of those, the majority, are along the mid-ocean ridge system because of the connection of needing a heat source to drive the hydrothermal convection. I'm not sure you may have said this, but what is the mid-ocean ridge, just in case people don't know? Yeah, the mid-ocean ridge is, is the longest chain of volcanoes in the world. Um, it is about 40,000 miles long, and it essentially marks the boundary between two tectonic plates that are spreading apart, and we have lavas erupting and creating new oceanic crust. Okay, um, and all of this under the ocean? All of this is going on under the ocean. In fact, mo the majority of volcanic activity occurs under the ocean. And for the most part, we don't know when it's going on. And actually, this is a great image for uh, what I want to ask you next, because it, it looks like smoke, right? It looks like s smoke coming out of these vents. But And this question was in our pre-show, but in case uh, people missed that, uh, why is the vent fluid black? Yeah, well, first of all, these structures, which look like chimneys, are called black smoker chimneys, which is really not a very good name because, as you just pointed out, that black that you see discharging from the chimney isn't smoke at all. It's actually a fluid. And what you're looking at is the um, is particles of minerals of things like copper, iron, and zinc sulfide that are precipitating out of the the, the fluid as it comes out of the vent and mixes with seawater. Um, and the seawater is colder and oxygenated 
the minerals precipitate out and build these beautiful chimneys that you're looking at right here. So the black is really little tiny particles. Yeah, that's that's correct. Tiny particles of, of minerals, of copper iron and zinc sulfides. All right. Uh, so Susan, I'll start with you, but I'd, I'd like to hear from everyone on this one, actually. Um, tell us about the first time you saw hydrothermal vents in person. How did you get to see them and, and what was that like? Oh, I remember this and I'll remember it all my life, I think. It was the 23rd of May of 1986 and it was Alvin Dive number 1677. And I had been working on hydrothermal vents for almost 10 years before I actually got the opportunity to see them firsthand. And my the person who'd been my thesis advisor invited me on a cruise to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean where we were diving to try to find the first hydrothermal vents to be observed in the Atlantic Ocean. And I remember standing on deck before getting in Alvin uh, on a beautifully sunny, calm day. And I was so excited, but I was also a little bit nervous about what it would be like to go down there. <laughs> and going down, as you can imagine, it's very, very dark. Um, and we have red lights on in the uh, in the sphere of Alvin, so we can at least see each other. And then when you get to the bottom, it's just spectacular. Initially, when I got to the bottom, uh, we were cruising over lava that was just black lava. And we came up on the side of this mound and I saw these fantastic chimney structures that were absolutely teeming with billions and billions of shrimp. And it was so exciting. And as we cruised around this hydrothermal mound that we were on top of, um, we just saw and for a geologist, this was a little difficult because I was trying to describe <laughs> the chimneys and they're covered in all these shrimp. But it was one of the most exciting things that I have ever done. Some amazing footage. Um, Rika and Tim, do you want to talk about your first time seeing a hydrothermal vent? Tim, you go. Um, December 15th, 1993. Uh, you never forget the date. First time you see the uh, dove a mile and a half down, it was um, in 1991. Alvin had discovered a volcanic eruption, just like volcanoes erupt. Lava poured onto the seafloor and wiped out all the communities that, that lived there. And as a graduate student, it was my PhD thesis to go and see how the new vents that formed in 1991, how they became populated with animal communities. No one had ever done this before. And so I had the first dive of the of the 20 dive program with Alvin. And I was so nervous. I'd been studying the video like Susan had been working uh, two years. I'd worked to know every inch of the seafloor that we were going to cover. And I got down to the bottom, I'm highly claustrophobic, uh, but it was it was fantastic. I'll never forget a minute of that dive. But life had sprung uh, at those vent systems. There were giant tube worms and muscles. It was amazing. Uh, I was standing up and jumping up and down inside the submarine to the point where they had to stop the dive till I would sit down because I was so excited. I'm <laughs> so embarrassed. Not I've never me, told Tim. anybody <laughs> that before. But anyway, it was it, if you ever get a chance to dive an Alvin, you must do it. It's a it's a, a memory of a lifetime. Oh, sign me up. Rika. Yeah. Well, I haven't been doing this quite as long as uh, Tim and Susan have, so I don't have quite so many Alvin dives under my belt, but I've got a couple and um I'm gratified to hear I wasn't the only one who was nervous the first time because you're just terrified. I remember dangling over the surface of the ocean the first time I went down and looking out the window going, what am I doing? How do I get myself into this situation? <laughs> but then you get into the water and you just start to focus and you start to go down. And um, I remember one of my favorite experiences from that descent as you're going down, they they turn every, all the lights off. So it's really dark and kind of quiet and sort of soothing. And when you look out, there's an example of the Alvin window right there. When you're looking out that window, what you start to see as it goes from sort of light blue to deeper blue to black, you start to see little lights like that start to show up outside your window. It's bioluminescence. It's tiny little organisms that are basically reacting to the movement of the submarine as you're going down. And you don't really know what they are because you, all you see is tiny little lights. And so it could be tiny microbes. It could be a squid. Sometimes you can tell if like some of the lights move together, you're like, oh, that was something big. 
And I remember one time I went down and I knew to expect this. So I, I was glued to the window and the Alvin pilot looked at me and said, all right, well, you think that's cool? Check this out. And he flashed the lights and these really bright beams that just like shot out into the ocean. And he's like, okay, just watch. And all of a sudden, all those lights, all those fireworks became like three-dimensional and you could see them deep out into the ocean. And we realized that all the stuff we'd been seeing until then had just been right next to the window. But when we shown those Alvin lights, the other organisms farther out could sort of sense that and they were responding to us. So it was almost like we were talking to the deep sea. It was just one of the wow. coolest experiences I've ever had. That's so cool. Um, so I'm gonna have uh, Susan take us back a little bit even further to 1977. So that was uh, almost a decade before uh, you did your uh, first dive to event, Susan. Yeah. And that's when hydrothermal vents were f actually first discovered uh, by a team uh, led by then uh, Hui marine geologist Bob Ballard. Um, and I think we have a shot of Bob Ballard that we can show, but there he is, uh, young Bob Ballard. Um, so tell us about that. Uh, how and where did they find those first vents? Yes, yeah, so they, they went out to a site on the, near the Galapagos on a spreading ridge um, where some previous cruises had showed some evidence that water at the bottom of the ocean in that spot was 0 0.2 degrees centigrade higher than the surrounding bottom water. And so they went back out there with this device, which is called Angus, and it looks sort of clumsy, and it sort of is, um, and it's, a, it's essentially a vehicle that you tow behind the ship. And the ship that went out there was the research vessel Knorr out of Woods Hole. Um, and the scientific party went out with this vehicle. And this vehicle on it had cameras, lights, and a temperature probe. And it was lowered down close to the bottom of the ocean and towed around for a while. And as they towed around, they could actually uh, monitor in real time the temperature of the bottom water. And they, they found an anomaly. But they had to wait to bring the vehicle back, the towed sled Angus back up on board and take the camera and develop the film because it was all film in those days in the cameras, unlike today. They ended up with 3,000 color photos that they had to go through. And by matching up the times from the temperature record and the images, they found a section of 13 images. And these are some of them that showed clamshells that you can see here, and there were also mussels on it. Um, and so this was the first indication that there was any, any sort of life that might be down there. A lot of them were dead. And so there is an area now called the clam bake because they thought somebody had had a clam bake on a ship and thrown the clams over the side. Um, but on that cruise, oh, and then- Because Alvin nobody arrived. thought there was life at the bottom of the ocean, right? So it's That's right. more and likely Alvin that arrived. it would have been tossed over than- Right, Alvin arrived and um, did a dive. And on the first dive saw these clams and mussels um, and later they found other things. But the, the one interesting thing about it was there were no biologists on board. It was geologists, chemists, and geophysicists. And the, ge the biologists didn't get back there until 1979. Well, two years later, wow. Yeah. All right, so, um, so as you said, Angus was uh, a towed sled, essentially, that was towed behind the Knorr. Um, and then uh, we saw, you talked about how uh, Alvin has been used to explore hydrothermal vents. Um, and we've, uh, scientists have also used ship tethered, uh, remotely operated vehicles uh, like Hui's, uh, the Hui operated vehicle, Jason, um, which I'm sure we'll see some images from Jason as well tonight. But um, so my question is this though, the ocean is huge, right? It covers 70% of the planet. How do you even go about looking for new hydrothermal vents on the seafloor over such a big area? Um, Tim or Tim, Rika, you do you want to take that question? Yeah. Oh, sure. Well, you know, I think Susan mentioned we've now discovered more than 500 vent sites around the world. And, and that progression parallels the development of technology to be able to do that. And so we, we call it Angus, you know, a dope on a rope. Basically, it's a tethered, you know, thing you just tow behind the ship and and you don't know really, it takes a picture, but you don't really know where the picture came from. You don't know the latitude, longitude, and that kind of thing. Now, today, 
we have autonomous underwater vehicles, which are essentially drones that you program on the deck of the ship with a com- through a computer. You release them free of the ship. They're not tethered. And they run the, the pre-programmed mission uh, over the seafloor and the water column. And you can load them up with sensors, detect temperature, turbidity in the water, um, all kinds of different chemicals. Uh, and so they traverse like this over the terrain of the seafloor. They can take images every few seconds or video, and they run through plumes like vent, vent water like you're seeing here uh, to discover vents. And so we often start with a big area that, that they survey autonomously, maybe for 24 hours, and then we get narrower and narrower as we hone in on the plume signal that's coming from the vents through temperature and turbidity. And so we've used these in 2002, I think was the first time we discovered a vent just purely using autonomous underwater vehicles. Okay. I was actually struck by something Susan said. Um, It was only point, did you say 0.2 degrees Celsius was the anomaly that was first detected that clued people in that there might be something going on? That's right. It was um, 0.2 degrees centigrade above the bottom water temperature. But once they discovered them, um, temperatures at those sites, I think, got up to about 17 degrees centigrade or so. Okay, so that's, what is that in Fahrenheit? It's around uh, it's about 60s, 30, maybe? No, um, 17 centigrade is about, yeah, in the, uh, it's about, yeah, somewhere in the 60s. Yeah. Well, and sometimes when we're trying to sample vents from a, using a different method where we have basically an instrument on a wire called a CTD mm-hmm. that just sort of sniffs out the ocean, we have to do something called a toyo, where it's exactly what it sounds like. You drop the instrument on the wire into the water, you lower it down towards the bottom of the ocean, and then you tell the captain of the ship to slowly move the ship and you start moving the instrument up and down, up and down, mm-hmm. up and down, trying to find this tiny little change in temperature that tells you you're right above a vent. It's, it's wow. kind of a hunting mission. Yeah, that sounds very tricky. Um, All right, so I want to bring in a question from the audience. Let's see what we've got here. Um, uh, So this is a question from Glenn. Um, So if the heat coming out of a vent could be as high as 700 degrees Fahrenheit, how far from the vent does that extend? And when does the temperature get mild again? So... Here's here's an analogy. Imagine a big bathtub full of ice cold water and you take a syringe and inject into it um, some very hot water. You will see that the heat dissipates very fast. And the the reason that you see those black um, minerals precipitating out in the fluid is because it is already turbulently mixing. And you have to go only a very short distance away, probably tens of centimeters at the most, um, to get back into normal temperatures again. Uh, we have a question from uh, Robert, and you may have answered this earlier, but uh, Robert's seven years old, and he wants to know what is the biggest vent? So you, you mentioned, I think, 80 meters earlier, was I, it? I, the ones I've seen have been up to 80 feet. I believe there's feet. one that's Sorry. called Godzilla. And I, I don't remember how tall Godzilla was, but I think it was higher than that. I think it yeah. was more like, um, it was over 100 feet. It was over I 100. Think I think Godzilla yeah. collapsed later on. It was so big. Yeah, its own weight. it did. Right? So that's like a 10-story building? Something like a 10-story yeah. building, yeah. <laughs> okay, so pretty big. All right, so I want to switch gears now and talk about all the animals that we've seen some glimpses of already, but uh, the animals that live at hydrothermal vents. So, Tim, before vents were discovered in 1977, did we know that there was life at the bottom of the ocean? No, right? Well, so we did know that it was at the bottom of the ocean, but not like this, right? And even in 1948, we had the deepest images ever taken in the Puerto Rico Trench that showed life, but this was different. This was, um, you know, several hundred years ago, it was thought that, that animal life dissipates or gets fewer and fewer in numbers and abundance and diversity as you go deeper. But this, for the first time, showed that there's massive amounts of biomass. Um, you know, this is, this is life based on chemicals and, and microbes. This is not life that's bound by the sunlight and requires sunlight. And so we knew that existed. It's called chemosynthesis. And that, that existed in the salt marsh. In, in small clams that had microbes with them, 
the microbes would help turn over the energy from the well, hydrogen sulfide is what it is at vents and in marshes. That's that rotten egg smell you often get. And so, but what we, what we didn't understand for the first time, we didn't expect to see animals like this of such massive biomass, giant tube worms like what you see here that are, you know, you see these tube worms, they have glands that run down their bottom, their bodies, and they produce these white tubes. It's like lipstick, right? These little red plumes can come up and down and go inside the, 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 the casing, you know, the tube. And those, and how, how big are those? These can be 10 feet long. Oh my gosh. And wow. it's astounding, right? And you had clams the size of dinner plates. It was amazing what they found, all based on chemosynthesis. So it wasn't believed that chemicals like this from the earth could, could harbor this much life and host this much life, right? And it's the adaptations that these animals had that weren't figured out until the early 80s um, that revolutionized the way we think about how life can exist. You had life that was extreme temperatures, right, up up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit in some cases, uh, you know, and so they were exposed to this toxic soup of chemicals, basically would kill us within a minute, loaded with carcinogens, methane, hydrogen sulfide, really nasty stuff, and yet life was not just surviving, it was thriving, and that's what really was changed the way we think about life that exists on Earth or anywhere else for that matter. Yeah, so Rika, tell us more about that. Um, how does that all really work? Yeah, sure. So if you think about, you know, what life on the surface of the planet would depends on, all of the food chains that we know of that we think about here on the surface of the planet are all based on sunlight, right? We're eating plants that are getting energy from the sun and turning that into sugars that we can then eat. And that's the basis of all of the the lions and the giraffes and the monkeys and the newts that live out in the vaults or live outside. Um but at the bottom of the ocean, there's no sunlight. So that can't form the basis of the food chain. Instead, there are microbes that live in and on and around the rocks and those animals that you're seeing here. And the microbes are taking in what Tim called toxic chemicals, but to them is food. They're taking in things like hydrogen, carbon dioxide, iron, and sulfur. And they're turning that into, well, using that as an energy source to make food, turning it into things like sugars. And then those can move farther up the food chain. Um, and I just want to go back to one thing Tim said about these videos, by the way, are just absolutely amazing. These tube worms that Tim mentioned, they're basically just sacks of bacteria. They don't have a gut. They don't eat. They don't poop. They basically, so here's an example of a tube worm that I had from a hydrothermal vent. Actually, it might've been one of these guys. I mean, this is just a sack of bacteria. All that happens is you have bacteria that live on the inside of this worm and the bacteria are taking in sulfur using that as an energy source to make sugars and then feeding that to the worm. And that's how the worm actually eats. And this really tight symbiosis changed the way we understand biology. Yeah, that's amazing. So actually just so that people know what they were looking at, the red part, what is that on the tube worms? So that's called the plume, but it, it functions as a gill. That's where the vent water goes into that feathery gill like structure there. And, and it goes into the bloodstream of the worm and brings it down to that bag of bacteria that Rika mentioned. So it has no mouth, no gut, no intestines, nothing like that at all. It just has this, this plume that you see here, which is like a gill, and it has a new kind of hemoglobin in it. The hemoglobin in the blood actually binds up the sulfur or the sulfide and makes it um, non-toxic as it brings it into its body. So the animal maintains a certain pH to be able to do that. It's a remarkable adaptation. It's just amazing. But it's red hemoglobin like our hemoglobin is red. That's why they're red. That's why that's why they're red. Yeah, so cool. Um so we and know that they're people might ask Vernie yeah. what these other these are these other red things on the on the tubes oh, right. are, yeah. are actually polychaete worms. They're another kind of worm. And they're crawling all over uh the tube worm tubes here, uh eating microbes. They're scraping microbes off of the uh off the tubes. Okay, so those are the little red things on the white yeah. tube. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see if there's an audience question. Let's see. I just want to see if there's a good. All right, we'll come back to these. Some of these are touching on topics that we'll get to. Oh, here's a good one. Rose wants to know uh, what your favorite creature from around these vents is, but maybe we'll get to that in a minute. I know we're going to see more creature pictures in a second. So we'll hold that question from Rose and we'll come back to that. Um, 
So we know there are events uh, from the tropics to the poles. I think uh, Susan mentioned that earlier. Are are all these events similar? And do you see the same kind of animals at them or, or not? Tim, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so that's one of the most remarkable things um, is that the animal life is different uh, in different events around the world. And here's here's a map showing you where the there's uh, little dots all over the ocean that show they're all color coded to the type of animals that live there and show how they're distinct. So the ones you see off of the eastern part of the United States and, and Mexico are in the yellow there are the riftia tuberums we just saw in giant clams and mussels, um, as opposed to looking in into the Atlantic, you'll see giant swarms of shrimp, which we saw earlier. Um, really amazing. So it's just like we have uh, kangaroos and koala bears in Australia and elephants in Africa and lemurs in Madagascar. We have the same thing in the deep ocean, which is astounding to me because you, know, you can see that the continents might say they're separate, they're isolated and separated. So yeah, maybe you'd have elephants evolve only in, you know, in, in Asia or, 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 or Africa, but the ocean's one big, large thing, right? What is, what is the isolating things in the deep ocean? And that has been a, a you know, a, a field that's, that's been born out of some of these, uh, the discovery of hydrothermal vents is trying to understand the biogeography of the distribution of life on, on, in the deep ocean. And it's, it's funny because, you know, we've got hairy snails, right, that, that are in the Western Pacific. And it, I mean, they're so different. Uh, we have these things called Yeti crabs in the Southern Ocean. These are large crabs with, that have furry arms that we don't see anywhere else. Here's go. an example of these guys, right? They grow these spines on their arms and they only find them in the Southern parts of the world. Um, and they grow microbes uh, on those arms and they scrape off the microbes and farm them. Here you can see them waving in the, in the, in the vent water. Uh, to, to do this. And so we don't see these in the northern parts uh, of the vent fields around the world. And what we're seeing now is we get these animals, we go around the world and collect these animals, we look at their DNA and compare their DNA. And like, here's giant clams. And, and we see we see clams all over the world, but they're all different species and they're massive. But, and so we get the DNA of these things around the uh, animals around the world, and we compare them, we, we make family trees of them. And we're, we're coming to the conclusion now that a lot of the origins of the ancestors in these trees come out of the Western Pacific. And they've migrated the, so around Indonesia and around Japan, and they've come eastward into the northern part of the, of the Pacific Ocean, down California, in the most derived or the youngest fauna, the lineages that are youngest in the vent world are in the Atlantic. And so that's where we have those massive amounts of shrimp. We don't see tube worms. We don't see the rifty in the Atlantic. It's, it's a total different evolutionary lineage and separation. Here you go. Here's some footage that was collected by Alvin just six months ago in the deepest vent field uh, known on Earth. Uh, and that's 5,000 meters just south of Grand Cayman Island. And so these shrimp are, are simply amazing. And each, even though we see differences around the world, each of these species has such Unbelievably, unbelievable adaptations. These shrimp, for example, are, are just fantastic. You'll see close up image here. You don't see the eye stalks that normal shrimp have. Right. With. They've lost their eye stalks. And they've, they now have, instead of a rostrum or like a bayonet on the front with teeth, it's now just a plate in the front. And you see this white U-shaped structure on their back. That's where the pigment of their eye has migrated to. Um, and so we now know that white material you see there as a U-shape is, is a novel eye that exists nowhere else in the animal kingdom. And you'll say, well, you ask, they say, Tim, it's, 30, it's three miles down. There's, you just said there's no light down here. What are they looking at if they have this eye? Well, we now believe that the, the vents are so hot at 350 degrees Celsius that they actually have black body radiation. So dim light gets emitted at the throat of the vents where it's really hot. And we also have learned that the, when the minerals form, like Susan talked about, right at the opening of the vents, that minerals form right there where they precipitate out, that that also has photons that come off. That's actually light that gets produced. And so we think that these shrimp have evolved in the last 28 million years to have this novel eye that can image dim light at the vents and keeps wow. them there 
so that they can feed off the microbes that are growing on the chimneys. So, so yeah. <laughs> I, I guess my question is, so is the geology also different at these different sites, Susan, or are all vents like the ones we saw some earlier footage of? Right, so a lot, of, a lot of these vents uh, or a lot of these communities that Tim has been talking about um, are associated with the black smokers on, um, that occur associated with volcanoes. Um, there are some parts of the ocean that where the geology is different and you have vents of different chemistries. And one of those is a place in the Atlantic Ocean that I think Rika has, um, has worked on, um, where instead of having volcanoes as the, as the plates separate out, instead of having volcanoes, um, there are no volcanoes. And what happens is that that rocks from deep in the earth, from the, the mantle, which is the layer beneath the crust, get lifted up and exposed. And in those areas, the chemistry is very, very different. And the, um, yeah, and here we are. And this is what you get produced. These are actually chimneys that are made mostly of calcium carbonate. Um, and so these are very different from the chimneys we've seen made of copper, iron, and zinc sulfides. And the reason these are different is because the chemistry of the reactions between the water and the rock as the seawater um, circulates through the rocks is different. In this situation, the, the fluid coming out is very alkali and it contains a lot of methane and hydrogen. Whereas in the black smoker case, it can, the, the fluid can, is acidic very reducing and contains a lot of hydrogen sulfide. And so I think that, that there are some differences in chemistry, but the issues that Tim was talking about, I think still remain a mystery. And Rika, you've worked on this site, right? I have, yeah. And I'm gonna talk about these in a second, but I just wanna jump in and say that the first time I learned that there are different types of hydrothermal vents all around the world was when I was a college student during the C semester program back in, I don't know, a long time ago. And Susan came in and talked to our class about all these different <laughs> types of hydrothermal vents and it blew my mind. And now here I am <laughs> studying these same vents, talking to Susan, which is just delightful. <laughs> um, but Lost City is, it's just amazing. And I will say that when Susan came and talked to us, that was before Lost City was discovered in 2005. So we didn't even know that this was out there. And so when they found this, it was just astounding. And so like Susan said, these white chimneys are just towering and the fluid coming out is a little bit cooler, a much higher pH. So one of my colleagues who works on Lost City, he likes to say it's like the pH of toilet bowl cleaner. <laughs> the microbes <laughs> think it's home. Um, it's uh, very full of compounds like hydrogen and methane. And so the microbes that live at Lost City, that's what they're mostly living on. Things like hydrogen, methane, and carbon dioxide. And they're turning those elements, those compounds into energy and food that then gets fed higher up at the food chain. The thing that I like about Lost City is um, we like to say that the microfauna are um, larger than the macrofauna because these chimneys are kind of covered in what frankly looks like snot, um, but that snot is actually the microbes. They're kind of coating the chimneys, living in the rocks and living on all of the animals that I think actually live here. And, and Tim, you know a bit about the animals that live at Lost City, right? Yeah, we've done some work at, at Lost City and you know these structures are, are 180 feet tall. These are massive. And, and yes, they're, they're carbonate and you see a lot of surface area here. You, you, you would think at first, glimpse that there's no animal life here you, where, where are the tube worms and where are the muscles and clams and whatnot and 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 if you get take a sample of this just like you know a, a softball size sample you can find up to 60 species of animals it's just that we're hypothesizing right now that the there's not enough energy to actually grow big biomass you know instead of being really based in sulfide which grows the big tube worms and the big clams and everything it's just hydrogen and it's CO2. And so there's not enough there. The average vent site, and I think there must be, I don't know, at least a dozen of them now in the, in the, well, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the, the Atlantic, have about 60 species on average in each one of those sites. And that's what Lost City has too. You just cannot see them until you sample them. And there are crustaceans there, there's worms there, uh, a wide variety of species. The other thing about Lost City is that it's shallow right? It's 800, 800 meters depth. And, and we've been talking I'm about- I'm sorry, where is it in the ocean? Yeah. 
it, it's in the central um, Atlantic. Okay. Northern Atlantic. And, and so, um, but we know that, that chemosynthetic life, at least the animals, um, we've been talking about those that are 2,000 meters and deeper so far in this conversation. We get the big biomass guys there that they, have, they haven't really evolved to populate the shallower vents around the world. And so Lost City being at 800 meters is also kind of getting shallow for the, the real big animal life you see here. All right, so we've been talking about different kinds of vents and, and the different communities that live there, um, so geographic variations, but what about variation over time? So up here on land, we have seasons, for example, um, but what about at the bottom of the ocean? Does it stay pretty constant um, all year long, or do hydrothermal vent communities experience seasons or, or other kinds of changes? Yeah, that's a great question. That's one of my passions is to try to understand that because um, the the as Susan mentioned too that these are these are volcanoes essentially right they these are magma chambers underneath the sea, the seafloor and they erupt and they sometimes they don't breach the seafloor they just crack the seafloor they heat and cool the and can contract and expand the seafloor and so a lot of dynamics are happening here and those animals are relying on the fluids that are coming through cracks from the to the seafloor and so that chemistry changes all the time the distribution of vents can change all the time and sometimes you get eruptions like what we're, what we're showing here uh, if we go back to that eruption again this is something we found in 2009 it's the only eruption that we visually have documented on the seafloor in real time this is on west mata seamount it's about a mile down um it's the top of the seamount and you're seeing hydrogen gas bubbles come out of the seafloor covered and shrouded in lava the bubble collapses and the lava splays out and is super chilled by the near freezing water and falls back down to the seafloor is rock. It's a you're seeing new earth form right here and lava roll downhill. Oh. And so over the course of about four hours, we saw six feet of seafloor be created. And we had 200 pounds of rock land in our vehicle. We had to spend hours getting rid of that rock, but um, just astounding what we to be able to see that happening. And it's just a testimony to how dynamic these places can be. A few meters away, uh, the only life that was on the seamount were these mobile shrimp. These shrimp only live on volcanically active seamounts in the Western Pacific and off Hawaii. And so here you see the shrimp. That some of them are female. Some of them have eggs. Or they're, It's just called Shrimp City. We came back here three years later to look how the community had changed. There was no more venting. That was all over. And what we found in the same place as Shrimp City is are these shrimp. They had changed in abundance. They had gotten so, so it's like a carpet of white it is, shrimp. It was unbelievable. I've never seen this many shrimp in one place at one time. And so many of them have eggs and are gravid. And we did genetic studies on them and to show that they actually came when the larvae were released off the seamount and came back to that seamount, that same vent system. But there was no venting here at this time. And so the shrimp were just living off the microbes that I think that existed through that venting uh, as long as it was there. So I don't know what's there now today, but it's just a testimony to how things change and so rapidly uh, abundances and diversity of, of, of life. And we even saw this happen in the very first vent sites that were discovered in the Galapagos Rift that we talked about. You know, we they were discovered in 1977, as we said. The 25th anniversary was in 2002. And so it was my first cruise as chief scientist and Susan came out with us. We went back to the classic vent sites. We wanted to see how they might've changed in 25 years. Mm -hmm. So here's a picture of something, the iconic place called Rose Garden. This is where the first Riftia were sampled, these two worms and their physiology discovered and, and textbooks changed after the, the site was uh, sampled. So we came back to this place 25 years later with Alvin, we dove down and lo and behold, we didn't find Rose Garden anymore. We found fresh lava flows with lots of little anemones on them and these crabs were on them. And we searched and searched for Rose Garden. We found that there was a volcanic eruption that took place and wiped them out. And new vents were created. And in these new vents, there are new cracks in the seafloor, new water was coming out. We found new colonizers. Riftia was just coming in to settle. There were lots of gastropod uh, snails, and other things that were coming in, many of them were very small. 
but it was a, again a testimony to how things change all the time and every time we go back to these sites we always say hey you know this may have erupted we got to be ready if it's erupted what are we going to do we better take water samples we better take biology samples let's get ready and so it, it's so dynamic it's so thrilling uh to be able to go and, and and look at these places and how they change is there a predictable order to it the way there might be like you know with succession in a forest yeah, well you know funny you ask that was my phd and in, in it and we i followed 17 sites uh with rifty and Tevia, you know, mussels other two berms, 17 species and 17 sites and there was a predictive succession is what we call it uh, and so there's small tube worms that come in first and then fish come, the mobile fauna come in first after an eruption to recolonize. But the thing is, is right after, you know, the aftermath of an eruption, the hydrogen sulfide and other chemicals are really of high concentration. The heavy metals are high. And so there's a physiological barrier to colonization and coming back in. Then I feel like the animals are sorting through time in their colonization based on what they can withstand. And so there's this certain tube worm that comes in that's like a weed. It can it can withstand um, this this really this toxic chemical soup that's really intense. And then rifty will come in later, and then mussels will colonize, and then clams will colonize. And then when the vent water shuts off, because it often does that, just shuts off without an eruption, the mussels will live the longest because they can filter feed, and they can live past the vent life uh, living. And so here's an example of some giant clams that's, that are all aligned along the cracks going in. Mm. And so this is, a, if I saw this, I would say this is the midlife uh, of, a, of a vent system in terms of the communities. Um, it's not, it's getting old, but not, you know, not real old. And so, right, we're yeah. Getting, we're getting tons of audience questions here. So I want to at least bring in a few. Uh, so wait, uh, let's see what's a good one here. Um Okay, do the animals evolve at or around the vents or somehow find their way there? That's interesting. So yeah, so it's 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 a good question because what we've found is what we call endemics. These species are endemic to vents. They can only live at vents. And so they have to find these vent systems. And as Susan mentioned, their size, I mean, they could be the size of my office, the size of your living room. Uh, and they may be separated by hundreds, if not thousands of miles. And so the, the larvae that get cast up of the eggs and the larvae that go up in the water column from these animals have to find though that living room. And so they tend to do that within a certain region and they may come back to the same vent systems uh, in time. And so they do evolve, let's say in situ in a certain area. Um, and so, and they've been doing that for I think hundreds of millions of years. We have fossils of tube worms that go back that far. So interesting question. Um, Emily would like to know, have you attempted to look at the vents using other kinds of seeing technology like uh, night vision or LIDAR or radar, um, not using light to, to see if light is actually changing their behavior? Hmm. I guess that's a Tim question. Oh, no. <laughs> I think that LIDAR is being used in some, in some cases. Um, uh, in shallower water, uh, in vent systems, uh, in similar systems like vents. Um, you know, I think that there's been attempts to use certain kinds of cameras that are a different kind of spectra than white light. Uh, that's been done in the deep sea quite a bit, looking at corals, but not so not so much at, in, in vent systems. Uh, the issue of disturbing the, the eyes of, of the fauna there is a whole other, you know, sort of lecture to go through. But but um, there are tests that we we're doing even now, even six months ago, to see if we do have some effect because they do live in darkness. They they often don't use their eyes, even though they they have rudimentary eyes. Uh, the shrimp I talked about do have functional, we think functional eyes, and we're doing working on those. So we're very careful. We don't see a lot of behavioral changes though. When we dive with Alvin or other vehicles and we shine our lights on. We don't see the animals changing the reactions. They seem to be doing the same behaviors they were doing, you know, when we look at them in the dark or a little, very little light. All right, we have a microbe question here for you, Rika. Um, Milan would like to know, can you bring these microbes from the vents up to the surface and cultivate them? Uh, or is that too hard of an environment to, to replicate? We can, yeah, um, and I've tried it. I'm not very good at it, but it's something we definitely do. And what's different about 
these microbes is they're living in temperatures up to 122 degrees Celsius. So that's hotter than the boiling point of water. So when we're trying to grow these microbes in the lab, we basically have to put them in something that's hotter than boiling water. So we usually use oil and we usually will put the microbes into a tube that is sealed off because the other thing these microbes often do is they can't be exposed to oxygen. And so we have to use really special culturing techniques. So we put them in these tubes that seal off. We put special kinds of gases in there so the microbes can breathe and eat the things they like to breathe and eat. And then we put them in, in really hot temperatures and it usually takes them a couple of days to grow up. And then if we want to take a pause and you know put the microbes in deep freeze, we just stick them on the lab bench because that's like the refrigerator for them, just room temperature. <laughs> um, and one for Susan. Uh, this is, uh, I think, from Lynn um, or Madeline. I'm sorry. Is there any way to predict how long a venting site will be active? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, it's it's not possible at the moment to predict how long a vent site will be active, but there are several ways that a vent site can shut off, especially a, a, particular, a particular chimney, for example. The first way is that the, the pathways of fluid through that chimney can get blocked by all the minerals precipitating in it. And so the fluid will no longer be able to go through the chimney and it will have to find another route and the chimney will essentially, will essentially die, if you will. A second way is remember that we need a heat source in order to drive that circulation of seawater through the seafloor. As you do that, you're cooling the heat source. And so if you cool the heat source, that hydrothermal system will no longer run, the convection will no longer run. So as you can see in this animation, the seawater will no longer be able to be um, heated up and rise up to the surface. And that will also shut the system off. And then on a much longer time scale, geologic time scales, as the plates move, they may move away from the source of heat that's driving that circulation. And therefore they will essentially stop circulating. But those, we don't know the timing of any of that. And it's probably very variable depending on the local situation. So Susan, I wanna stay with you um, and, uh ask you both what got you interested in hydrothermal vents and then for those of us who who aren't uh, marine scientists why are hydrothermal vents important why do they why do they matter well i got interested in hydrothermal vents um back in 1974 i was looking for a thesis topic at the time and i went to a conference that was held in woods hole that was looking at all the evidence that hydrothermal systems had to exist at the bottom of the ocean and the person who ended up being my thesis advisor happened to say to me one day, you know, we've got some rocks in the Hui rock collection that have clearly reacted with hot water based on the minerals that are in them. You could look at those and see what happens to their chemistry. And so I analyzed the rocks and I analyzed the fresher version of those rocks and tried to look at how the chemistry changed. And it was about six months after I finished my thesis, the first fence were discovered. So that's what got me interested. Why, why do I care and why should we care? I'll give you three quick reasons. The first one is, as you've heard from Tim and Rika, um, these systems generate the gases, the reduced gases, hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, methane, that basically support the whole microbial ecosystem that supports life at the bottom of the ocean around these vents. The second reason is a reason that I'm interested in, which is that as the fluids circulate, chemical reactions occur. And I think we might have an image of this. Yes, this is just an example. As the fluid goes down, you can see that different elements move in and out of the fluid um, as it reacts with the rock. And you can imagine that if you're passing seawater down and turning it into an acidic, pretty nasty fluid coming out full of metals, it might in fact help regulate the chemistry of seawater. And in fact, it turns out that this system is particularly important for the element magnesium, which is a, a, a very common element in seawater, which goes into the rock it's also important for sulfur and phosphorus, and it is a source 
of the metals, copper, iron, and zinc. And then the final reason that I'll give you is um, when we mine copper and zinc on land, and there's one particular example that um, I can give you, which is on the island of Cyprus. Cyprus is named after the Greek word for copper. And these copper mines, which have been mined for many thousands of years, um, actually exist in a chunk of ocean crust that instead of that has been thrust up on top of the continent. And so you can go and walk around ocean crust on Cyprus and in that crust are these mineral deposits and they formed at the bottom of the ocean. Now, economic geologists typically go to these and look at these 95 million year old rocks and try to determine how these uh, mineral deposits formed. Today, we can go to the bottom of the ocean and actually watch mineral deposits in the process of formation. And we're learning a lot about how they form and where and where, where they might form and therefore where to look for them. So we actually have a question related to those mineral deposits at the bottom of the ocean uh, that came in actually before tonight's event on, on email. Um, this question is from Will in Vermont. And it's about the potential uh, mining of large deposits of rare earth elements and other commercially important metals that have been found around hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. And, and Will asks, I wonder if the panel can comment on whether humans can mine these, meaning the vents, without destroying them and their special habitat. Yeah, um, just, just to be clear, around these types of vents, the minerals that you would probably want to mine would be copper and zinc, maybe silver and gold. The rare earth elements that, that you just mentioned are actually found in a different type of deposit, which are manganese nodules and crusts, which okay. form in a different part of the ocean. But, you know, I think in terms of the economics and technical difficulties of actually mining something on the seafloor, bringing it to the surface and transporting it and extracting it, um, which is not what I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about. I think as a scientist, um, my concerns would be that in order to get that material, you have to essentially dredge all that material up and remove it. And that is going to really change the habitat and the environment. And given the, what we've heard about tonight about the biological communities, I think we would have no idea how that would impact those communities. And there have been some suggestions of on a given mineral deposit, preserving a section of the deposit to try to preserve the animals, but we don't really know over what distances they colonize. So I think, um, there's a lot more we need to understand before we attempt to do it, regardless of the economic or technical um, issues. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and go to you, Rika. Um, you study viruses at hydrothermal vents. What got you interested in that? Because <laughs> there's so many of them. Um, <laughs> if you were to just to give you an example. So if you were to take all the viruses in our world's oceans and you were to line them up end to end, they would reach across the Milky Way galaxy a hundred times. <laughs> and I have said this sometimes to other people. And I remember once there was an astronomer sitting in the audience and he kind of looked at me. And then I saw him like doing some math on his notebook. And then he went, hmm. So there's, there's a ton of viruses out there. We've done the math and we don't really know what they're doing. I want to be clear about one thing. These viruses, for the most part, the vast, vast majority of them aren't infective to humans. Instead, they're infecting microbes. But that matters because the microbes are basically the engine of our oceans. And I just talked about how they're the engines of these hydrothermal vents. They're the base of the food chain. They're crucially important. And these viruses are infecting these microbes. And by infecting the microbes, they're affecting microbial ecology and they're affecting microbial evolution. They can even manipulate microbial behavior in really crazy ways. Uh, so this is a microscope image that I took from a hydrothermal vent a few years ago. And I added a special dye that will glow when you shine UV light on it. Um, and so you can see the big blotches here are the microbes that I was talking about that live at these hydrothermal vents. And maybe you can see in the background these tiny, tiny little speckles of light in the background, 
those are the viruses. And you can see how many of them. And this is just a tiny, tiny little bit here. There are probably about 10 million viruses per teaspoon of hydrothermal vent fluid. And we know so little about them. And they're probably messing with the evolution and messing with the ecology of the microbes at the base of the food chain down there. But there's so much left to discover. So if there are viruses and bacteria, could we also expect to find antibiotics or, or other cures or treatments for human diseases in vent environments? Yeah, potentially. Um, one really interesting application um, is that several years ago, some folks pulled out a protein, an enzyme from the kind of microbe that tends to live in places like deep sea hydrothermal vents. And that protein or enzyme was used in a process that we call PCR. And PCR, polymerase chain reaction for those who care, is basically a process of making lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of a particular stretch of DNA that you're interested in. And so this has been used for all kinds of applications. Perhaps the one that we may be most familiar with these days, unfortunately, is COVID testing. So we use PCR to amplify or make lots of copies of the DNA that we got out of your nose and the viruses that were in your nose. And we make lots of copies of that bit of COVID DNA, SARS-CoV-2 DNA, so we can see, is it there or isn't it? So we really have these heat-loving microbes that live at places like hydrothermal vents to thank for that technology. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, Tim, did you want to add anything? No, I just just say those those same enzymes that that uh, Rico was just talking about, you know, enable the human genome project to happen. Mm -hmm. And and there we are learning about, you know, now we're looking at custom, you know, biomedical, you know, applications of, of that kind of thing. And and so, you know, it's the a lot of the basic research that we do is gonna be applied then to societal relevance and things that we need in the future. And, you know, I feel like the the adaptations of vent life. And I'm talking about the animals, you know, the proteins, the enzymes they have, you know, not only inform us about how we've evolved our enzymes and what we can tolerate, uh, but our, but biomedical applications for the future. Here you're you're seeing these worms we call alvanelid worms. They live on the sides of active black smokers. That's all that's the only place we see them. They are, we think, the most urethermal animal on earth, meaning they they span a thermal gradient like no other animal. If you in a minute, you'll see these these tentacles that, that surround the mouth. They're called buccal tentacles uh, as they eat microbes. Well, you can see them there. You see part of the body. Um, the that those tentacles are in freezing water, two degrees Celsius water. But the hind end that's toward the chimney can be as hot as 175 degrees Fahrenheit at the same time. And, and so they have different kinds of microbes along their back, different communities that we've looked at. I mean. They have novel enzymes, proteins that withstand the heat, um, you know, that we can learn from. They've adapted to pressure. They've, you know, and pressure is notoriously bad for damaging DNA. And the, we think these animals have novel repair mechanisms to, to repair the DNA, things we haven't explored yet. And I, I think that's one thing that keeps me coming. I mean, I love the basic research of understanding how life has evolved. Because there's so many adaptations here, I don't know why we're all not studying these things. <laughs> um, but but you know, I feel like in the in the long run, uh, we're going to be looking to these animals for cures for diseases. They've solved problems already that we haven't. They've solved problems with their proteins under high pressure. They that that would cause our proteins to be dysfunctional, right? In other words, some of the biomolecules these animals make to withstand the pressure and keep their proteins functional in their cells. We're now testing those in Alzheimer's and field trials in humans to see if they're if they're applicable to a, for a cure for Alzheimer's. And so I think more and more we're going to be looking to these this, this life, whether it's microbes or the fauna, uh, for solutions to our problems. I want to take a, another audience question. This one is actually from one of our YouTube viewers uh, who goes by the handle Lancer Biker. Uh, some scientists believe that life may have begun at these vents. Have there been any studies into whether vents may have led to the development of the first cell? Rika, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, life, absolutely. Early life on Earth. And, and as long as we're going there, uh, you can also touch on uh, how about life on other, other worlds? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, let's start with life here on Earth. So there are quite a few scientists who think that hydrothermal vents could have been one of the most important places for the origin of life on Earth. And the reason for that is actually linked to what Susan was talking about earlier, which is these the gradients that form in hydrothermal vents. She was talking about how in one part of the vent, you have 
400 degrees Celsius water, four times the boiling point of water. And then just a few feet away, you have water that's almost freezing. And in between those two things, you have all the temperatures in between and all these different chemical compositions in between. So hydrothermal vents are almost like this perfect natural laboratory to do all of the kinds of reactions that may have been necessary to make life's first building blocks. And some studies have actually looked to see at what kinds of potential building blocks come out of hydrothermal vents. One of the places that's potentially most promising is the lost city type vents we were talking about earlier. It turns out those kinds of vents create the kinds of organic molecules that could have been used to form the first building blocks of the first DNA or the first RNA, the first proteins, the first cells. And other people have looked at it from a different way. So instead of doing lab experiments to make those building blocks in vent-like conditions, instead, like Tim, they're looking at modern life, modern microbes, and sort of reconstructing what the last ancestor of all those microbes, all life on Earth, could have looked like. And some people think that it may have looked a lot like the kinds of microbes we see in deep sea hydrothermal vents. So the case isn't closed. There's still a lot of disagreement in the field, but vents are definitely a, a tantalizing place uh, for, you know, potential place for life's origins. And then when you start moving beyond life here on Earth, we think that there are probably several places in our own solar system that may have something like hydrothermal vents. So in our own solar system, as you can see from this image here, there are several ocean worlds. So our own Earth, of course, is one of them. But there are also some moons around Saturn and around Jupiter. Um, two of my favorites here, you can see Europa on the left there. That's one of Jupiter's moons. And Enceladus at the top, this tiny little moon that goes around Saturn. And both Europa and Enceladus, and these some of these other ones you see here too, they have an icy crust on the outside of the moon. And then below that icy crust, you have this vast ocean. So we call them an ocean world. So here you can see that icy crust on the top. You can see that huge deep ocean below that icy crust. And then you look at the bottom there, and we think there may be something like hydrothermal vents at lurking at the bottoms of these oceans. And what's cool is that that could be a potential place for life to potentially originate and potentially survive today. Now, I should be clear, we don't know this for sure. We don't know if there's any life out there. We haven't really had the chance to look very carefully. But one of the first clues that we've had is that one of these moons, uh, Enceladus, the one that goes around Saturn, is basically it's spewing its guts out into the solar system. So it has these huge plumes that are coming off of the moon and we can send probes through there and kind of sniff just like we do with vents. You can kind of sniff to see what's there. And we're seeing compounds that look a lot like what you'd expect to come out of hydrothermal vents. Um, and I think Tim, you're starting, you're working with people to take a closer look, right? Yes, that's right. Um, so we, uh, Woods Hole here, I've, my lab has teamed up with uh, NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, to go deeper. Our deepest vent site in the in the world is 5,000 meters um, mentioned earlier, but that's only half of the of the depth of our ocean. And right now we don't really have vehicles that can go down systematically and go to those deeper depths and look for hydrothermal vents and look for the adaptations that we're talking about. And the NASA has gotten involved because they want to explore ocean worlds. And I'm involved because I'm going to explore this ocean world uh, at great depth. I'm going to look at the adaptations life has for living at 7,000 meters, 8,000 meters, all the way down the full ocean, 11,000 meters. And so I'm I'm almost positive that there are vents and things down that deep in our own ocean, and they're going to be new animal life we've never seen before. New species, new ecosystems living on different kinds of, of energy sources, just amazing. And so we have built this autonomous underwater vehicle called Orpheus. So it's full ocean depth, uh, we built two of them actually so far, uh, and we've been constrained by the, the NASA way of thinking, lightweight, miniaturized. This thing weighs 500 pounds as opposed to most AUVs that are a couple of, I don't know, 1,000 pounds. Uh, it's only six feet long, and it's, you know, it's easy to deploy, and it can land on the bottom, unlike any other autonomous vehicles that I know of. It can sit on the bottom and, and interact with the bottom, take measurements and, and uh, sample and things. Here's our, an animation of our vision of it on the seafloor uh, here. So we've, in order to detect life in, in a European ocean, we've got to do it here first, right? And when you get through the top ice on Europa, which may be, you know, 12 kilometers, you know, 10 miles thick, you're going to be in a, under pressure in that European ocean that's going to be similar to what we see 6,000 meters and deeper on Earth. So we've got to go deep to, on Earth to be able to use the analogy to going to Europa, that makes sense. So 
So we're looking at at um, advancing our exploration uh, in our own ocean to facilitate those on other worlds to find life outside of Earth. So we are running out of time. In fact, we're over time. We've got over 250 questions that have come in, so we haven't even begun to touch the surface of those. But there's one question that I'd actually like to close with. Uh, if and I want each of you to answer it just quickly. Um, it's actually a question from uh, an audience member, Carolyn. Um, and she would like to know, what do you still want to discover or learn about vents that scientists don't already know? Um, let's see, Susan, why don't you go first? OK, what I would like to know, because I'm interested in the chemistry of seawater, I would like to know, I would like to have a a model, a predictive model as to where to go to look for vents. We've got some parts of the mid-ocean ridge system where we sort of understand it and others that we don't. And if I could predict how, where the vents are likely to be and how many there are, I could be, I would be able to understand the chemistry of the ocean much better. All right. Uh, Tim, are you still thinking? Do you want Rika to go? <laughs> Rika can go. <laughs> I can <Don't> answer. <laughs> Um, well, because I'm so interested in, in origins and early evolution of life on Earth, I want to know what's driving the evolution of the microbes in these systems. So, you know, what are the forcings that are, what are they reacting to in their evolution? So one thing we're starting to do now is we have a place where we're taking sips from a hydrothermal vent about every two weeks for about five years. Um, and we're going to use that to take little snapshots over time to see how the microbes are evolving in real time and get a better sense of what it is that, you know, what makes them tick evolutionarily speaking. So you have an automated sampler? Down yeah, there? there's a sampler sitting okay. on the seafloor just okay. taking sips every two wow. weeks. All right. Very cool. And Tim? Yeah, I think I'm tied with two things, but I, I want to know, I'm, I'm with Rika, I want to know how life has evolved to have these amazing adaptations and so many of them. And if that's come from deeper waters or shallower waters or, you know, how, how life actually is able to find vents, evolved to find the vents. So I, I think a lot of my driving force right now is to go deeper uh, and find those evolutionary origins and commonalities uh, among uh, vent life. All right, well, I'm so sorry to end this conversation. It's been really great, but unfortunately that's all we have time for tonight. I wanna to say a big thank you to Rika Anderson, Tim Shank and Susan Humphreys for your many fascinating insights on hydrothermal vents. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you also to all my Hui colleagues who've been working very hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. And to everyone who joined us on Zoom, on Facebook, and on YouTube, thank you. Tonight's event was the first in our fifth season of Hui's Ocean Encounters events. Please join us again in March for our next Ocean Encounters. We'll be talking about jellyfish and other squishy creatures in the ocean. We're calling it jellies, how soft bodied animals help shape the ocean. Please watch our website, hui.edu, for more information about that. In the meantime, you might want to also take a look at the very cool merchandise at Hui's online store. That's at shop.hui.edu. You get a 15% event discount for joining us tonight. You just type in the discount code VENTS. If you enjoyed tonight's Ocean Encounters program, you can become a part of Hui's solution-based approach to ocean science. Please consider becoming a Hui member. You'll be providing crucial support for our outreach and our science, and you'll get some great benefits in return. Memberships start at just $40 a year. For $60, we'll send you that cool whale t-shirt. Uh, the average gift is actually $120, but any amount helps. Your support will make a difference. Please stay with us. We've got some more amazing footage to share with you. You'll get to see what it's like to dive in Alvin and explore the seafloor. Um, but on behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, I'd like to say thank you very much and good night.